The boot camp series historically, historically, three years in a row, has been about things, about, about sort of the plumbing of pharmaceuticals, stuff that you might not have learned unless you worked in industry, like how do you take a chemical and put it into a tablet that goes into someone's mouth and is stable for 36 months? Um, and that's the, the, the time when we learned about the relative solubility of the Taj Mahal versus your drug. That was a fascinating talk. Um, and we just heard, had one about microbiology. So these are all science topics. Um, but there's another plumbing topic that has not been discussed as broadly as it should have been. And as many of us who've been thinking about the, the economics of antibiotics have um, worked a lot about the cost of preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three, but it's taken us a while to realize we needed to also articulate what comes next. And so the, the panel before you uh, was very courageous. I asked them to do something, can I call it scary? Um, stand up and, and talk about some, some really painful, difficult stuff. And they're going to leverage, they've all had personal experiences with this recently. And I'm fascinated to hear about drug why and why it is that it's worth whatever it's worth or not worth at the moment of approval. Over to you. Great, yeah, thanks, John. And I'm really excited to, to get to present this today and, 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 um, and chair the session. Uh, I think this is something that I was motivated to try to address in a forum like this at last year's conference in Lisbon when we kept getting hung up on, you know, let's make the trial twofold smaller, let's change this, let's change that, and it wasn't getting to the heart of the issue that we, we, we've been waiting a decade to actually fix, which is the moment the drug's approved, it's worth a lot less than zero dollars, and we can't seem to bridge that gap. Um, and even all the interactions I had last year as we went to approve our first drug after 16 years of effort, um, you know, people saying, well, now you have revenue, everything's great, and they have no idea how much worse it is than it was the year before when we were running the phase three trial. Um, and so, so first point of order, our fourth speaker um, ha had, act had a conflict and couldn't make it. Um, so actually we're lucky that Kevin Krauss uh, has played roles both as a late stage developer and, and clinical microbiologist and a person in corporate development. So he's going to be taking both of those um, pieces of our overall thesis. Um, and so yeah, so the, the, the focus statement is up above. It's really, let's just pretend that it's free to get something approved. Why is this still not going to work? Um, and then myself, so just as of this week, I am an independent consultant for CIPLA USA who bought the US rights to plasmiasis and the drug I worked on. Um, but really, all of this experience is coming from the 16 years I spent founding and then uh, working at a cage and uh, ultimately being the head of research at the end. Um, and so obviously for everyone here, we're all being as courageous as each individual thinks they can be about being frank about you know, the challenges we face. But you have a good diverse set, at least of um, different types of experience. So I went from forming an entity, first synthesis, all the way to approval with one thing. Um, I think between Kevin and Rolf, uh, at the launch and approval stage, um, Televancin, Avicaz, Ceterolin, Plasomycin, like six or seven or eight different drugs. Um, so they have a breadth of, they've seen this many times over, uh, so they can sort of contrast you know, different launches. Um, and then Craig is actually uh, gonna do our supply chain inventory, the kind of tech ops. He's super valuable to me because he has one experience in antibiotics and he can contrast that with the much more lucrative areas of medicine, I guess I'll put it. Um, so here are my asks for the session. I mean, we're all trying to get everyone focused on the specific thesis, which is if you're just handed a drug that you have worldwide rights to, how much is it worth today? If you've invested nothing, you have to pay no investors back. So we're trying to focus on that specific piece of the issue. Um, and so there's always the temptation to see one problem and try to solve it. So we're just asking you to sort of sit back and just immerse yourself in the chaos with us until we get to the end of the thesis. And, uh, and we promise everyone up here is malleable. We're not going to try to tell you this is how it is. I think we're going to share our stories and try to open some eyes. And, and I think once I started to see this problem over the last couple of years, it really makes it hard to get back into the space. Because to me, there's only two groups working in the space, one that doesn't know about this, and the others that are praying something's going to change by the time they get to approval. And that's really the only two groups that are out there left, left anymore. Um, so the first point of order, of course, this is all Big Pharma's fault. So yes, all Big Pharma's fault, right? And so I, I've never really worked in Big Pharma except for a short internship. Um, but, but no, I don't blame them for, uh, for this issue. So they're doing their job, right? 
and their job is basically to return money to investors and to prove the fact that I am contributing to the problem and supporting them exiting the antibiotic space, I went into my oldest son's college education savings plan, 529, and he's invested in the age-based moderate 2030 fund, right? Sounds pretty, pretty balanced investment, and you look in there, and it, there's about five or six pharmaceutical company stocks that are owned in that portfolio that I invest in for my son, and one of them is active in the antibiotic space, the other five are not, and there's no, not a single public traded antibiotic company in that portfolio, and thank God, because if there were, he wouldn't be going to college. And so, you know, I, I, I point out that I never worked in Big Pharma, but I feel really defensive for them. That they're just trying to operate their business. And the problem here is we have to fix the system um, so it works for everybody. And, and then all the other problems take care of themselves. And so really the failures we're seeing with the public companies, again, all my opinions, not the opinions of the entities I've represented in the past, is that this has always been the case. We're just seeing it laid to bear in the public markets because the small companies don't have the revenue from their other products to basically cover up this giant hole we're about to talk about. And so now we're in a situation where it's all laid to bear for everyone to see. And so it's not a particularly complicated equation. So basically, our argument is the cost to do business is much greater than the price you can charge for your product times the amount of times it gets used. That's just the fact at every launch. Um, the fixed cost to do business, we're really trying to be reductionist and get to core things that are really hard to argue with. Because, um, of course, you can blow this away and, and add all kinds of bells and whistles and have a huge team. Uh, we're really trying to get to the core issues in the business that are there right as you're approved. Um, the limits on pricing, there's lots of articles on that and where we're sort of stuck there. And then the limited number of patients, we're trying to get there before the problem is cataclysmically bad, but the math doesn't work at that point in time. Um, and then, of course, hopefully when we finally fix this someday, the issue that, you know, the most rare things, there's no mechanism to get better reimbursement for something super rare. So today, an oral drug for ESBL UTI is more economically valuable than an IV drug for acinetobacter. It just is. So how do we fix these problems? And they're all driven by number of patients and price. So this isn't a new math problem. So in the early 1980s, we faced this issue that there were diseases that were so rare that you basically couldn't viably create a product to solve that problem. Uh, and this is language directly from the Orphan Drug Act. Um, and basically the thesis was that if it's so infrequent, the disease, that you basically cannot recoup the cost of development, and then I added the parenthetic in here, which is also you have to continue to manufacture and distribute and ensure quality of the product. That wasn't considered back then. That's what we're talking about today, so I highlight that. Um, but when there weren't enough patients to make the economic model work, we had to change something, right? And so what is the orphan cutoff later in, after the bill was passed? There was actually a number assigned to it. It's 200,000 patients per year. If you're less than that, you're too rare to economically be viable. Okay, so then on the, that's on the right-hand side, just as a visual. On the left-hand side is the CDC's estimate from 2013 on the number of patients with CRE in the United States. <laughs> Thanks, John. And so it's, it's essentially 20-fold uh, higher than what the CDC estimates for CRE. So if you're working on CRE, you're 5% of what you need to be to be below the, the orphan drug cutoff threshold. And then there's an industry publication from 2016 that's more in line with what our thinking was internally, and I think it's sharing some notes between other companies that we think maybe the estimate now is more like 50,000 cases. Um, but you're still well below the, uh, the orphan drug cutoff. And of course, a really reasonable person said to me, um, well, you can't get orphan status because you can use your drug for non-resistant infections too, so that's why you can't have it. So I said, okay, so the only way this works is if we misuse the new drug. You're telling me that's the only way this can work. Um, and so we're stuck in this situation where we have an issue where what we're really trying to solve for is rare. Yes, you could use the product for other things, but is that the right thing to do? We're being told no, so we don't do it, but then there aren't enough patients and we go out of business. And so it's, it's a really obvious sort of predictive cycle that's gonna keep happening. So with that, I leave you with the super simple equation, and uh, my colleagues are gonna start to talk about the cost piece. Um, what does it take to do business? So first up is, is Kevin, and he'll be talking about, finally you've got approved, you're done with all those clinical trials and stuff, right? No, you're not, and there's quite a bit of work to do at that exact moment in time, and so he'll talk about that. <laughs> 